If we told him to keep it short, he would have had a longer prayer. But... Yeah, we need men that like to pray, don't you think? Yeah. yeah. Prayer is just asking for help. You know, men aren't known for liking to ask for help, but uh, if we were going to do a song today called You Can Have My Heart, right? So that's the deal, Lord, you can have my heart. And uh, everything else we can do in our own strength, but we just get exhausted. So I'd much rather let him have control of the wheel. All right, so we're going to jump into the word. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you that that word is, is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path, that before we knew you, we were just groping around in the darkness. But, but when you came into our life, when you, when you turned that light on for us to see who you were, who you really were, not the religious version of you, but who you really were, the God who knew us in our mother's womb, who had a calling on us while we were being formed in our mother's womb, and you had a, a destiny and a direction for us even then. So we found you and you turned us around. We, say, we sing it, you picked us up, you turned us around, you set our feet on solid ground. Lord, we're so grateful for that. So as we talk about your word today, Lord, we pray it will not just be a, a head, head knowledge, but it will but it'll be nourishment for our soul and our spirit, man, that we will come alive through the nourishment of that bread of life and the living water that you give us. We say not by might or by our power or intellect or, or reasoning or our IQ level, Lord, we want to be led by your spirit. You don't look at the outward appearance. You look at our hearts. And we say, you can have our heart today. Could you say that with us? You can have my heart. You can have my heart, Lord. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. So I just thought I would give you a little personal history. I know a lot of you are newer here. Um, that picture on the left is uh, my grandfather. His name is also Peter Roselli. And uh, slight, slight resemblance. <laughs> Haven't told. And uh, the man on the right is my father, and that was his high school graduation picture. And um, you know, like you look at some of the, you, I didn't want to even show you my high school graduation picture, but <laughs> he was born in 1921, so he would have been 100 years old this year. Very different world, you know, because the Depression, uh, you know, he, he was born seven, eight years before the Depression hit, so he knew what that deprivation was like of living through uh, the depression. And my grandfather, uh, the tall man on the left, it's hard for you to see it, but look at the hand that's holding the baby. Can you see how big that hand is? Yeah. And can you see how dark it is? Yeah. He was in the coal mines prior to being a garbage man. So this is what a lot of the uh, people that came over from Italy came through Ellis Island. They would find the other immigrants that were from their part of Italy, which in our case was East Orange, um, is where they settled in East Orange. And he went out to the coal mines for a while, but then came back and started a business. It was really just a horse and a wagon, and he would go around to people's homes in, in East Orange and clean out their uh, furnaces. He would take the, uh, what was left over after you burned up the coal and bring it outside. And he would wear a white shirt and a tie every day as a garbage man. Because, you know, you, you can maintain your dignity no matter what you're doing. And you could even just see in his stature that he was a man who was going to give it his best and not be judged by what other people thought of him because it's a great country, isn't it? Yeah. You can come here, and if you're willing to work hard, you can get ahead. Hallelujah. <laughs> Let it be so, Lord. And my dad, by the time he was, this picture was taken, at seven, he was 17 years old, uh, and he didn't have an easy childhood. My grandfather had... Uh, many children, and not all of them lived. Well, my father was the third of three boys, and they were working every day before school and every weekend, and he had a head for engineering, so he became the mechanic once the trucks were invented and they were, they were buying trucks. He had to make sure that those trucks were going out every day. They didn't have a lot of money, and if you get a, at a contract with a town, which they did, ironically, the first town was Roselle Park, New Jersey. My last name is Roselli. And people say, well, why don't you spell it with an I? Because that's what it sounds like, Roselli with an I. And I said, well, this man, my grandfather, did spell it with an I. But his first contract was with the town of Roselle Park. So he had his name legally changed so people would think he was somehow connected with the town. <laughs> well, you do what you got to do when you're, uh, when you're an immigrant, right? And you're fighting for your, uh, for your existence. But it's a really interesting spiritual point because... They would have to sign what was called a performance bond. 
with the town. As you know, if you've ever lived through a strike, if you've ever had a, a strike by the garbage man in your town in the summer, you know what it's like when that garbage isn't getting picked up, don't you? <laughs> How many know? <laughs> so it's a matter of our public health that this job gets done. So once you say, I'm signing this contract, they're saying, the town's coming back and say, well, if you don't get the garbage picked up, we can go hire another company and, and they can come in and pick up the garbage and you have to pay them whatever they want to charge to do that. How I many know that's a good motivator to get up and go to work every day? <laughs> so my dad would get up 4, 30, 5 o'clock, work for a couple hours, go to school, come home, work for the business. No baseball, no sports, no nothing. And uh, by the time, you know, he, he got, my, my parents got married and, and I, I came along six years after they were trying to get pregnant. It, you know, he finally was getting a break to be able to relax a little bit after working seven days a week for most of his life. And we know that's not a godly pattern, but they didn't know the Lord. So they just were trying to survive. And I didn't understand it when we were, when I was a child and he wouldn't be there uh, on a Sunday, for example. Uh, we would be going to church, my mother and sister and I would go to church and he would be playing golf with his friends. And it wasn't that he didn't care about us, but I didn't know that. He was making up for all the years that he didn't have any free time. And once I understood that, because I asked the Lord to show me, then I looked at him completely differently. And I was able to say, yes, be with your friend. Be with us too, but be with your friend. And maybe that helps somebody here today, right? Because you can be holding resentment towards a father. I think that might have happened once or twice in human history, that people have held resentment towards their fathers for not being there for them or for not doing what you needed done. But as I already alluded to, the Bible says, we honor our mother and father that life may go well with us. There's no translation that says you only have to honor them when they've been honorable. <laughs> Some of us would like that, wouldn't we? Until you become a parent. And then you're really glad that it says that because you know that none of us are perfect either, right? Anybody want to object to that? Well, I got all this help here with me. <laughs> No, but because we're not going to be perfect and we would want our children to understand that, we, you know, my dad never read a book on parenting. That wasn't something that was part of their culture. I should have read more books on parenting and, you know, and, I, and I did know better and I still didn't do enough. I did as much as I knew to do. And, and that's what the Lord looks at is our motive and our heart, right? And just as, you know, when he got older and they were really, I mean, strong people. They were very tough and strong people, but... Uh, a, a, a tender touch was not part of the upbringing that my father had, okay? So it wasn't that he didn't know, he didn't, that he didn't want to do that. Then the culture that they were in, if you say that, if you have a tender touch and you tell your son that you love him, that, that's going to turn him into less of a man was, was the culture. You're going to have to fight. It's a cold, cruel world. People that don't know the Lord, that's the worldview, right? Do unto others before they do it unto you. So I'm not going to hold that against him because he got saved later in life Amen. through my mother who would not mind me saying that she's like a pit bull the way she prayed. That's the only way she was like a pit bull. But she was tenacious. And, and he had an anger problem, if you know anything about it. My dad, I've told, talked about it here, and she didn't care. She would just leave tracks in the bathroom. She would put the, the TV on when he would come into the kitchen in the morning. As big and tough as he was, she was smaller but tough. And she loved the Lord, and she loved her husband, and she wasn't going to stop praying. And one day on a ride down to the Jersey Shore, she put a, a cassette tape in, and he listened to a man's testimony, and he said the sinner's prayer after 25 years of her witnessing to him. <laughs> started coming to church, started putting, putting something in the offering, which was a big deal, because he used to argue with us. Trisha could tell you this. When we were getting married, he would be like, you give 10% of your income to the church? Like, what do you get for that? What do you get for 10%? He goes, I pay my taxes to get the Army, the Navy, the Air Force. Like, he runs down the whole list. What do you get? My life was saved. <laughs> How about that? What's my life worth? My life was saved. And then my mother started reading a chapter a day with him, and... There was one day she forgot to read. And he's like, well, when are you coming in? we got to read our chapter. 
<laughs> See, Matt, the bigger they are, the harder they fall into the arms of the Lord. Don't give up. Don't give up. Never give up. And then, um, I, you know, he got a real good sense of humor, just like Trisha's mother ended up getting a really good sense of humor later in life. She had just as tough, if not tougher, life than my father did. She was from Italy and was there during World War II. And, uh, you know, wow, like trauma, like really tough issues. So by the time she came to live with us, she was starting to soften up a little bit. And, and then living with us, I think, really helped a lot. And, and you could see this great sense of humor come out that was always in there but had just been hurt and was stuck underneath. So anyway, you know, don't, don't minimize the value of your family. Don't hold up what they didn't do. Bless them for what they did do, right? And just believe that they did the best that they could because you don't know hurt people hurt other people. And, and we can't just hold them against a different standard than what they had to live through, right? So I honor my father's memory. I, I loved him while he was alive, and I, I love him in uh, memoriam now since he's been gone, since 2003. And I really do want my children to extend mercy to me too because I know I wasn't a perfect father. I hope they know that I did the best I could. And that's all any of us can ask. Amen? Amen. All right, so I'm going to jump in to Scripture. Thank you. He even, he even let me joke around with him a little as he got older because he had uh, listeria. I don't know, some of you folks in the medical field might know what listeria is. It's a bacteria that gets into food that's contaminated and it caused the same effect of having a stroke. <clears throat> Excuse me. So he couldn't move and he was, you know, kind of just deteriorating and that wasn't, that wasn't who he was. And he got more and more dependent on, on care, on medical care. So it's at one point, not long before he died, I would have to pick him up and I would be holding him and he'd have his hands around, arms around my neck. And I'd say, oh, dad, I don't want to put you down. I'm making up for lost time. You're hugging me. This is awesome. <laughs> and it wasn't to put a guilt trip on him, right? I mean, he was just, you know, street smart guy. He got it. And it was like, yeah, it's good for me too, but let me down. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, hallelujah. Thank God for the reality checks. I'm not going to talk long today. I don't have a lot of scriptures, but I do want to um, emphasize Jesus as our model and, and the relationship that Jesus had with his father, who is also our father. So when they said, teach us to pray, first thing, our father, right? We honor your name. Lord, we, re we recognize that in this sinful world, there's so many other things we could be following, but you pointed us to you as the plumb line of truth, as the one I can look to for my example. And I forgive those who didn't do the perfect job that they could have done, because I didn't do a perfect job, but you, you, were, you were there to help guide us and show us about forgiveness. I mean, if you can listen to Joyce Meyer's testimony about how she had to forgive her father, it's called One Life on uh, YouTube. It's free. It's a devastating story until you get to her point of, of the miracle of her ability to supernaturally forgive her father. And God can do that for any one of us. So it's never too late. God is the God of the impossible. So that we just ask whoever might be struggling with that right now, that they have that hurt in their heart, the scar tissue, the callus in their heart, towards their mother or father. Lord, we ask you to soften that heart. Bring in the oil of your Holy Spirit and soften that heart. And, and, and let them release that bitterness of unforgiveness so that they can walk in the fullness that you have for them. In Jesus' name. All right. So my, my text verse is pretty familiar. If you've been coming to this church any length of time, you know that we do deliverance here, led by my wife, Tricia, that we've taught many classes. One's called Possessing Your Vessel. If you're going to ever ask if you'd ever like to be involved in leadership here, that's one of the classes that we ask you to attend so you understand what, what core principles are important to us in this church. And, and one of them that I could kind of summarize is to say that we would rather grow our church in a slower, healthier way than demand people start doing things before they're, they're ready to do it, before they're mature enough to do it, before... Uh, they might not be doing it for the right motives and the right reasons because you want to have an emotionally healthy church if, if you want to see growth to be healthy. Uh, so again, a little bit of a tangent, but it's, it's, it's a verse that you will have heard us quote quite a bit at 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and it's really 3 through 5 
that, that you could look at in, in more detail, but you probably know it by heart. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the demolishing of strongholds, right? To the demolishing of strongholds. And those are those uh, patterns that set themselves up a, 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 an algorithm, I would say. And, you know, if you ever heard Dutch Sheets uh, talk about this, he, he does a great uh, teaching about it. Uh, the word is similar to Lego, that the words that we link together become linked like Lego blocks, and that forms a thought pattern that's an idea in our brain that tries to exalt itself against the knowledge of God. So what do we do with those? We tear them down. We tear down those strongholds that try to exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. Anybody know that's a good Christian thing to do, right? So one of those in our culture today is, well, if I'm a college student, I could just live with my girlfriend. I could just live with my boyfriend because we should do a trial run and see how it goes. Well, that might sound like a logical, good idea, but it's a complete violation of the covenant of the word of God. Okay? And there are spiritual implications that the natural mind doesn't fully understand. That has to be torn down. That's a struggle. It's an algorithm that's running in their brain that has to be deprogrammed, taken out, and you better replace it with a better one. But that's all of us, right? Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed into God's thinking, the Word of God, the Spirit of God living on the inside of you. Check everything against the standard of God's Word with the power of His Spirit in us. What a gift! What a gift that for free, if you have a device that can get on the internet, you can get 25 different translations of every book in the Bible. What a gift that is. There's also 10 billion other things you could be watching on that same device. So you need discipline to lock yourself in and recognize. And I'm sure many of you would have a similar testimony to me that it's very humbling to serve the Lord. Because just when you think, boy, I'm pretty proud of how humble I am, you start to see... Oh, you still got a little more to go there, bro. Thing goes deep. And not praying at the root is pride. Because Paul said pray at all times. So I wasn't doing it because I thought, well, I'll, I'll only pray when I need help. Because pride was saying uh, there are some things I don't need help with. Wrong. <laughs> you get the wrong answer. And God will let, let you keep taking that test over and over. You know what gabados is in the Italian? Hard head. <laughs> Sometimes it takes a few lessons. I call those the tuition payments in the school of life. <laughs> Reality is what you run into when you're wrong. <laughs> I wasn't going 95, officer. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 10. The weapons of the war that we're fighting are not of this world, but are powered by God and effective at tearing down the strongholds erected against his truth. What a good word, right? What an important base principle of our lives. We are demolishing arguments and ideas and every high and mighty philosophy that pits itself against the knowledge of the one true God. Boy, is that pertinent today in 20. 2021 in America, um, the, the language accusations of, of you saying a word being used as violence against somebody, right? That's a new concept in our culture. It was always about free speech, and that doesn't mean it was okay to use horrible language about people, but part of the, of the reason that it's a free country is because everybody's allowed to say whatever they want, and there are times you wish they didn't have that right. But there's something about the balance of the truth wins out. His truth is still marching on, the battle hymn of the Republic says, right? So we were always okay with debate, open debate. And you could say what you want, and I could say what I want, and may the best person win, right? That's a, that's a cornerstone of our culture. But as soon as you start prohibiting what people can say, you're on the road to a totalitarian state. And that's another day's lesson, but that's the problem. And if you listen to people who have lived in totalitarian states, and there's many of those that are on the internet that will tell you, warning, warning, if they try to take free speech away, that's the first domino that's the, always the one to go. And if you do nothing about it, then it's nobody's fault but you, is what they would say. I, I, I you know, many people that I've heard almost died trying to get to America because of that ability to be free. Oh, hallelujah. So that's another day's topic. But there are many 
high and mighty philosophies that are pitting themselves against the knowledge of God today. So this is a very relative message, relevant. And just to warn you now, there are going to be times that if the Lord shows us something about somebody in our church, we're going to tell them, you shouldn't do this. This is a really bad idea. And if your feelings get hurt by that, that's probably not a bad thing. Because if you're going in a certain direction and we have to tell you to turn, you might not like it. But we got to love you enough to do it. Because if we just say everything's okay, then we're in trouble with the Lord. Right? The gospel, when you confront people with the truth and they're living in error, they're not going to like it. And we are required to do it with love. Right? Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love. So I'm not saying that's easy, but I am saying people have said, oh, you know, we feel so judged. If I was confronting somebody, let's just say, hypothetically, that was living together and then wanted to be involved in ministry at our church, we would say, well, no, I'm sorry. You're welcome to come to our church, but we have requirements for leadership that you live according to the tenets of the Bible. And that means you can't live together. Oh, but it's just a platonic relationship. <laughs> yeah, I was born at night, but not last night. You know, that's what my father used to say. <laughs> right? And then avoid all appearance of evil and whatever. I won't go into details. But often the person's upset. But you have to love them enough and be prayed up enough. And let me tell you, praying in tongues, that's going to be Tuesday night's topic here. I'm teaching Tuesday night on praying in tongues and the power of praying in tongues. That will... If you take the time to spend time with the Lord and just speak, pray in the Spirit. In 1 Corinthians, it says, when you, when you speak in tongues, you're talking to God. Yeah. And you might not know what you're saying, but he's downloaded things into your spirit, man, that are going to translate into language that that person can hear your authenticity. It's because I love you that I'm trying to tell you you're on the wrong path. Right. Jesus said this, go and sin no more. He wasn't judging them, even if it hurt their feelings. The rich young ruler, he presented him with what he needed to do. The man walked away, and he didn't go renegotiate. Jesus let him walk away because he had to ponder the consequences of the decision. Aren't you glad you made a decision for Christ in your life, those of you that are saved? Wasn't easy. Plenty of things had to be straightened out. He made the crooked way straight. He turned my grave into a garden, a flourishing garden. Hallelujah. And then in Ephesians, I already quoted this, but in the Amplified, I like it. It says, obey your parents in the Lord, accept their guidance and discipline as his representatives. Now, you could say, well, why does it say obey your parents in the Lord? Because if you work for a family that's in the mafia and your father tells you to go kill somebody, that wouldn't be in the Lord, would it? <laughs> so you better start praying in tongues real quick on that one. Because <laughs> it better be another solution than that. Because you know too much, we have to kill you, right? And I could say that because... I'm Italian, right? So I can make fun of the mafia. We won't talk about the garbage business and the rest of that right now. <laughs> so obey your parents as long as they're asking you to do something that lines up with the word, I think is what Paul meant here. For this is right, for obedience teaches wisdom and self-discipline. Honor. Whew. This word is rapidly vacating our culture. <laughs> So not exactly a culture of honor in our society. Honor, esteem, value as precious. Can I say that again? Honor, esteem, value as precious. Yeah. Your father and your mother, and be respectful to them. This is the first commandment with a promise, so that life may be well with you. Yeah. And the Sanfords who wrote the book and a lot of the material that we use for the Possessing Your Vessel class, John and Paula Sanford, they took it another step and they said, that life may go well with you, and by implication, Anywhere in your life that you're not honoring your mother and father, life will not go well with you. Because right, right, right. this is part of that covenant commitment piece, right? Like, well, there's spiritual laws in effect that don't always line up with what I think in the natural, that you may have a long life in the earth. And I'll just take some verses out of John 5, and that'll be it for today. But that's a lot where we hear Jesus speaking about his relationship with the Father, and I think things that we can glean out here, right? So... First, it talks about the man at the pool, of the, uh, pool of Bethesda. In Jerusalem, they came upon a pool, the Sheep Gate, called Bethesda, and crowds of people lined the area. Now, remember I said last week that it's the countercultural gospel of the kingdom. And, and this is really a, a similar theme of that. This would really be kind of like part two 
of what that is. Like, what does it mean to be living in a countercultural gospel of the kingdom of God in the earth? It means that when you hear kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God in the Bible, you could rightly say that's going to be when we die and go to heaven, but you could also rightly say that it's God's existence in our lives here on the earth. Because why else would Jesus say, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? He's not praying, telling you to pray for the return of the Lord to pull you out of here. Right. He's like, no, Lord, I want to operate under your kingdom while I'm here. I want to be obedient to your kingdom rules, even though I'm in a secular society. And when he prays in John 17, he says, Lord, I'm not praying that you take them out of the culture. I'm praying that you give your power and presence to them while they're in the culture. And let them be catalysts and change agents in the secular world that those people will see something about your children and your presence in them that, that is going to provoke those other people to jealousy, to want what they have. Right. Anybody here get saved like that? That somebody was witnessing to you and it wasn't exactly the argument that they gave you, but it was the way they lived their lives. That they were provoking you like, wow, I don't know what that is that you have, but I want it. Lots of hands going up, and my hand would go up as well for my mom was the one for me. So look, this is really a powerful teaching on the gospel of the kingdom of God and the earth because it's not just sitting here waiting to die and then go to heaven, and I hope I make the cut. <laughs> it's, you're on a mission. Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. we got something to do be transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory. I mean, there should be no boredom in the, in, in the kingdom of the gospel of the kingdom. Everybody should wake up excited about another opportunity to serve the Lord that day. And it says all these people that were at this pool, they were disabled in some way. Some were blind, lame, paralyzed, plagued by diseases, and they were waiting for the waters to move. And I, until I saw this language that expanded a little bit, I never really pictured how destitute those people were. And I've been in situations like this when we were in Mozambique and we came upon a scene of, of many really hurting people that were out in the culture and it was like they were being cast aside. And I remember thinking, wow, I was in a room full of them uh, that, were, that were wanting to be taught the Bible and I would start to say, give, give them a teaching and there was no response. It was like they were already dead. They were breathing but they were already dead. There was no hope. Like the Sanfords, again, they compare it to a, a, a stove when the pilot's, pilot light is out. There was nothing there. There was no pilot light to spark the flame because they were hopeless. But God. But God. So that's what this group of people is. And, you know, the, the culture might say they believe in social justice, but actually getting out of your comfort zone and going to help those people, that's, a, that's another whole thing, isn't it? How many hours a month are we putting into actually doing that? Or do we, are we just happy to write a check and do it? Well, it's better to write a check than do nothing, but it's also good to actually look people in the eye that you're helping because that could be you someday. Right? right? right. And it might not be that you don't have money, but it could be that you don't have your health or, or some other reason. And that's what, what the Lord is going to keep saying to us. As you do it to the least of these, my brethren, you're doing it to me. Jesus says. So that's why we're trying very hard as a church to give you opportunities that you can get involved with other people in this church and go feed the poor and you know go go help people in some capacity. Amen. So anyway, they were they were in rough shape these people and Jesus plunged right in. He wasn't turned off by their condition. He never is. He hugs lepers. Nobody touched the lepers. He healed them, touched them and gave them love. The overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. He hugs lepers. Not afraid he's going to get their leprosy. <laughs> From time to time, a heavenly messenger, an angel, would come to stir the water in the pool. And whoever reached the water first and got in after it was agitated would be healed of his or her disease. And then in the crowd, Jesus noticed one particular man who had been living with this disability for 38 years. And he knew this man had been waiting there a long time. Do you ever just stop and put yourself in the, in the picture that you're reading in, in the Word and, and, and you're picturing what this interaction, Jesus looking at this man, and like, he's been there a long time and you would have pity on the man, but Jesus said to the disabled man, are you here in this place hoping to be healed? Right now, why else would I be here, Jesus? Like, what do you think I'm doing here? 
right? Like you could hear that from somebody. But the point that many pastors and, and teachers have made over time is that you can get used to a condition where other people support you. And that getting healed is going to be a dramatic shift in your life. And nobody's going to support you anymore. And you can get so conditioned to that state of mind that you're afraid to change. So when he asks us, it's like, yeah, do you, do you want this thing to happen? Do you really want to be healed? And we know the man said yes and was, which is a miracle, because Jesus prayed a really long prayer. The man said, I wait like all these people for the waters, but I can't walk. Jesus, stand up. That was his prayer. Stand up. He didn't scream it. Stand up! Just said, stand up. Isn't that nice? The complicated prayers of Jesus. Come forth to Lazarus. Stand up. That was all he had to say. Stand up. Here's the sin. Carry your mat and walk. At that moment, Jesus uttered these words. A healing energy coursed through the man and returned life to his limbs. And he stood and walked for the first time in 38 years. How about a hand, somebody? Hallelujah. Mountains are still being moved. But this was the Sabbath day, and any work including carrying a mat was prohibited. Sorry, Jesus, we're going to have to write you up. Three points on your license. This is not a warning. Don't do it again. And this is scary that this can happen, that legalism can actually shut our eyes to a miracle that's happening right in front of us. You better really say, don't let, don't let that happen to me, Lord. I'm not going to become that Pharisee that, that keeps you out because I, you don't fit into the box that I build for you. And the Jewish leaders began pursuing and attacking Jesus because he performed these miracles on the Sabbath. And here's my Father's Day tie-in, right? He said, look, my father is at work, so am I. If he's working, I'm working. You guys got the wrong definition of work. And the truth is that the son does nothing on his own. All these actions are led by the father. Anybody want to testify that you hope that's your mission statement in life? That I don't want to do anything unless I know it lines up with the word. Here's a clue. God doesn't look at pornography. Okay? So if you want to do this, don't do that. And he wouldn't, he wouldn't tell you not to do it unless he had a better option. And he does. It's called life in the spirit, man. It's way better. Anyway, another day's teaching. If you honor the son, I'm sorry. If you do not honor the son, then you dishonor the father who sent him. And I'm only taking a few verses. It's not an expanded teaching here. but I love this. Eternal life belongs to those who hear my voice and believe in the one who sent me. So if you could picture eternal life as something you already have, that your body shifted out of that death into this form of eternal life that the Holy Spirit represents, yes, it's true that the outward man is perishing, right? We know that. That's what it says in Scripture, though, the outward man is perishing. But the inward man is what? It's being renewed day by day. And when this life is over, we just take a different form of the eternal life that we already have now. And don't do anything to stop that eternal life from flowing. And what would stop that? Sin. So if your motivation not to sin is because you want to live a more powerful, productive life for the Lord, he'll make it easier for you not to do that thing. And that's why we fast, right? We we live a, a fasted lifestyle. We say, no, that thing might not be a big deal to you, but in my life, that became a stronghold. So I'm just not touching that anymore. The risk is not worth it to me. And me and you have already left death and entered life. A new day is imminent. In fact, it has arrived when the voice of the Son of God will penetrate death's domain. That's good wording. When my mom... And my dad were driving in, down the shore that day, and he heard that testimony of that man. Life penetrated death's domain in his life. And of all the things she witnessed to him for, for 25 years, that was the one. Who knew, right? One plants, another waters, God gives the increase. Keep living a life that, that causes other people to say, man, I don't know what it is about you, but whatever it is, I want it. Good goal, right? 
death's domain was penetrated by the voice of life, and anyone who hears it will live. And Jesus said, I have never acted and will not act in the future. Will I act on my own? So here's what I'm going to have you do to end this. Let's stand, okay? And we're going to do what we said earlier. You believe what I said, that your voice is a weapon for the kingdom of God? Yes. Right? Why else would the devil try to kill everybody with COVID and steal your breath? Because the devil knows this spiritual principle. Death and life are in the power of your tongue. I choose life. How about you? I choose life. That's it. Holy Spirit, make yourself even more real to me than you already are. I want to know you at a deeper level. And if you're confused about praying in tongues, just come out Tuesday night. We'll try to break it down the best way I can. And, and, and I'll tell you, there's probably many misconceptions that a lot of people have because it hasn't always been taught well. And if you want to just do a little homework, read 1 Corinthians 14, actually 12 through 14 if you want. Awesome chapters about the gifts. And, and, and we'll cover what we can on Tuesday. And we'll be doing more teachings. We're going to have midweek services, right? So hallelujah. I can see your faces. It makes me really happy. You ready? You warmed up? Yes. Going to decree? Yes. All right, so we'll practice on this. I have never acted. I have never acted. And will not act in the future. And will not act. On my own. On my own. All right, so what are we going to do? Here we go. I listen, I listen. to the directions, the directions of the one who sent me. So I'll start, and you just say it with me. All right, ready? I listen to the directions of the one who sent me and act on these divine instructions. Selah. Let that sink in. Uh, Jesus said, I never acted on my own. I always acted in accordance with what the Father was telling me to do. And he's the model. So if he did it, we can do it too. Yeah. I listen to the directions of the one who sent me and I act on these divine instructions. And this is the last one. So say it loud. I'm committed to pursuing God's agenda and not my own. One more time. I'm committed to pursuing God's agenda and not my own. Hallelujah. Lift up a shout. That's our goal, Lord. On Father's Day, we honor the Father. <laughs> and we, we just commit, Lord, that as hard as it might be to always pause before every decision we make and, and invite you into that decision, we commit to trying that if Jesus was our model and this is what he said, then it can't be beyond our reach, but it, but it needs to be a, an intentional thing on our part. So I pray for everybody here today that each of us would strive for this amazing goal, not in a works way, but that we aspire to be led in everything we do by who you are, what you say, and what you're showing us in Jesus' name. Amen. You all have an awesome day. We love you. I think we're still doing prayer today. I should have checked. I don't know if we are having prayer, but if you see people gathering up here, we're going to still have prayer today. And uh, have an awesome Father's Day. Love you all.